the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. No one in the Thank you. sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sin is forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ. Come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to Augsburg on this fourth Sunday of Lent. I'm Pastor Joe and it's a blessing to be here with you on this morning. A few announcements before we continue with our service. The dwelling right now as we speak right across the street is having their grand opening. They have already begun ministry in their new building so this is not the first thing. Pastor Paul is over there celebrating with them as they bless their building. We give thanks to the work they do there, and if for whatever reason you want to go see what it is, I will not be offended if you walk out in the middle of my sermon to go over there. So we give thanks, or head over right after church for lunch at noon. We give thanks for the ministry of the dwelling. So we give another thanks to Julianne, our music intern, and to Kristen, our handbell director, for leading music. In addition to Pastor Paul being gone, Dr. Olson is gone this weekend, so that's a lot of trust for those of us who are left behind. So a big thanks to to those leading our music this day. Pub Theology continues on Tuesday. We'll be at Radar Brewing at 7. We'll be talking all things gun control issues around everything there. So join us at at 7 on Tuesday at, at Radar Brewing for that. We're welcoming new members on April 2nd. If that is you or if that is someone you might know, please put them in touch with me so we can be sure they get what they need so we can welcome new members on the 2nd. And then finally, you received a bag when you came in this morning. Um, this is something that, is, that predates me, but apparently Fishy Forth is back. So canned fish, canned tuna, please put that in the bag and bring that um, next Sunday, and that will go to the food pantry. So we are glad to welcome back Fishy Forth uh, pre-COVID activity. With that, our service continues as we hear God's word. A reading from 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. 
The word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. A reading from Ephesians. Once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, sleep or awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread it on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying it is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man, but they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And the man said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. Jesus heard that they had driven the man out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have not sinned. You would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. I'd like to invite any children to come forward for our children's message. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody today? Great. Good, good. 
Well, let me ask you a question. If you close your eyes, can you see? Let's all, let's all try that. If you close your eyes, what can you see? Black, nothing, darkness, shadow. You can't see when our eyes are closed. Maybe some colors, too, when you look right at the light. Jesus talks a lot about seeing and sight, especially in today's gospel, but other times. And sure, Jesus is talking a little bit about actually seeing, because he heals a man who can't see today. But a lot of times, when about seeing, he's really talking about knowing things. So let me ask you another question. Do you know everything? No. No, great. Do your parents know everything? No. Great. Good job, parents. It was, it was a very emphatic no this morning, too, so good. We're all good. We don't know everything. So when Jesus talks about being able to see things, he's also talking about knowing things. And so in today's gospel, some people think they know everything, and they think they can figure everything out on their own. But who's the only person who really knows everything? Jesus, God, absolutely. So when we try to know everything, we say we don't need God. So we need to know that sometimes we don't know things, okay? And sometimes nobody knows things except God, and so we need to ask God's help to see those things that we don't know. So let's pray together. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for giving us the gift of being able to say, I don't know. Be with us when we can't see things and show them to us clearly. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up. You can back to your seats. I don't know. I don't know. Three simple words that seem next to impossible for quite a few people to utter. I've found it immensely helpful in my time as, among other things, camp counselor, confirmation teacher, and parent to say those words to the children I'm with. If I don't know or can't see something, it gives the students permission to wonder, to understand they shouldn't feel pressure to understand everything perfectly. And if you ever feel like you have not said those words in a long time, I have a three-year-old who would love to have a conversation with you that will pull those words out. But then we turn and we go on the internet. We read an article about how our politicians interact with each other. We tune into a lot of conversations in the world around us, and it seems those three words, I don't know, may as well be in a foreign language. Why are we as humans so darn reluctant to admit when we don't know something? Our gospel opens up with Jesus and the disciples walking along when they notice someone who is born without the sense of sight. The disciples ask ask Jesus why this man is blind, because in their culture, if you were without sight, especially if you were born without it, it was a personal failing. It was either the sins of the parents that caused this or the supposed sins that the man was going to commit in his life that had caused him to be blind. It's no one's fault Jesus said, great, in the gospel right there, beautiful. But, in fact, this man is blind in order for me to show God's glory. That's a whole nother sermon just on that sentence, and that's today. Come back in three years, and we'll talk about that. Without ever inquiring about the man's faith, which often happens in a gospel healing, Jesus spits, smears, and suggests that this man go wash in the pool of Siloam, And once he does so, he can immediately see a gift that he's never been able to experience in his life. So before we continue, let me ask this. If this man was a part of our community and all of a sudden one Sunday morning he walked through those doors and he was able to see, how do you think he would respond? Would you celebrate with him? If someone had been diagnosed with cancer and the prognosis was pretty rough and then all of a sudden they were proclaimed to be cancer-free, wouldn't you celebrate with them? If someone decided to try an experimental medicine or surgery to correct something that had prevented them from walking for years, would you not celebrate with them? Or would you look at them and say, hmm, that's not really you, is it? 
Shocking, right? But that's what this man's community did to him in the gospel. Day in, day out, they had passed him by, begging because that's all he could do in that day. They knew him. They knew what he looked like. They knew what his voice sounded like. So why, when seeing and hearing this man, would they say things like, this is someone like that blind guy? Or, if that is you, tell us how your eyes were opened. Really? They don't say it, but the subtext that I hear is, come on, we know this is too good to be true. Let us in on your secret, or else we don't want to be a part of you. They're saying, we don't know this man. I don't know his baloney. That's the one time where we, that's not a real I don't know. And what I hear and what they're saying is fear. Fear to admit there may be something they can't understand. Fear to admit that this man who they've looked down on and classified as lower than them his whole life may not be there. Fear that if the one of their truths that they know, if that was to come crushing down, maybe all of their truths will. That's not something we worry about today, is it? In today's culture of digging deeper into whatever stance we take, regardless of what experts say, this fantastical world we live in where alternative facts received a name a few years ago, and this extreme polarization that characterizes so much of our world, I'd say we've actually gotten worse at admitting that we don't know something than Jesus' counterparts 2,000 years ago. Why is that? I can't possibly hope to answer that question, but I can at least posit a theory. And that's that with so much information and knowledge out there just accessible at the tap of a screen, we've taken it upon ourselves to act as experts in everything. And if we're proven wrong in one of our views, well, we'll just go find somebody else who agrees with us. Because in just one of our stances, if we can be taken down, where does it end? Better to double down, create alternative facts, than to admit to ourselves we may be misguided about one of our own deeply held moral, religious, political views. Because if we admit we're wrong once, we've just opened the door to our enemies to take down our beliefs. This crowd, these neighbors of the man who had his sight restored, hint at this line of thinking, but the Pharisees flat out say it. It's the Sabbath. Of course Jesus healed on the Sabbath. He expertly times a great many of his healings, doesn't he? And therefore, say the Pharisees, anyone who knows anything about our religion we would know this man couldn't be from God because that's one of our top rules right there. And because this man who's been restored won't admit that we're right in our line of thinking, well, we should just cast him out of the synagogue, out of the community, blocked from communicating with the only people he's ever known. And even his parents, in a section we did not read from today's gospel, even his parents refused to admit their son may be right for fear that they would be cast out of this tightly controlled community. Now it's easy, I think, to see why the Pharisees don't like having their views challenged. They had power, they had authority, they were the line when it came to right versus wrong. But that didn't stop Jesus from continuing to follow his mission and making the observation that in their desire to hold on to their power, they had become blinded to the acts of God that were happening right around them. Why haven't we as the church learned since then? Why do we still continue to grasp at control and refuse to see acts of God happening right around us? Why does the allure of power and control in this day and age, embodied by numbers, attendance, giving, why does that dissuade us from seeing how God is actively changing the rules around us? Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. That is a challenging and a provocative statement at the end of this gospel. And one I take to be a charge to the church in this time. What if when we look and focus too much on our past, even if they were good old days, it prevents us from actively being able to see what God is doing now? 
And what if when we see what God is doing now, we begin to envision a future that may look totally different than what we've known? What if we even need to, like these Pharisees, acknowledge our core beliefs might need to be challenged? For the Pharisees, that challenge came in the form of the fact that the blinded could not see because blindness was obviously a result of sin. So the healing changed their rules. What if today, as with this man born blind, Jesus brings in those who've been cast out? What if those who've been condemned by the church as sinful or living in sin are actually nothing less than those who get to experience the grace of God first? I believe it's when we're open to acknowledging that no, we can't see it all, that God looks at us and says, but I do. Let me give you that light so that you can have sight. And then a future we couldn't possibly have imagined comes into view, maybe even one we have trouble accepting. But it's a future in which Christ says there is only one truth, and that truth is the light of my love for all people. No alternative facts here. Amen. and hope we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation.
Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Creating God by your word, you have made all things and you hate nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of all of creation from the grandest mountains to the smallest springtime buds. Lord, in your mercy. Powerful God, you anoint kings and establish rulers. Guide the work of heads of state and all elected officials. Encourage them to lead with justice to remove barriers. Lord, in your mercy. Shepherding God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep. Tend all who are sick and comfort those who grieve. Today we lift up Phyllis and David Tate, Lucy Davis, Joni Tilly, Terry Hayworth, Betty Jo Hartman, Colt Cameron, Andre Roche, Shirley Yount, Paul Tomasic, Michael Mite, Wanda Elliott, Gregory Florian, Charles Schoderbeck, Greg Kenton, Tom Mullins, Tommy Napier, Anne Marie Sneed, Susie Walden, Sue Hill, Gray Boyette, Sharon Schoderbeck, and all those we lift up on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God, our host, you fill us at your table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip, equip the feeding ministries of this congregation and community. Nourish us so we can nourish our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. God of history, with thanksgiving we remember our ancestors and faith who cared for your people. We praise you for the ways they form the faith of others and continue to inspire us. We remember Jay Bentz, Bruce Unger, Zelma Rohde, Nancy Spencer, Larry Turner, Reg Cahill, Marian Morgan, Chris Almarini, Nancy Julian, and Clark Comer. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. We give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Thanks. 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 Thanks.